So one of the uh, coolest, more primitive fishes are the lampreys. In lampreys, they don't have a jaw. Instead, they have an oral disc. And they have some really interesting life histories. For example, a lot of the species are anadromous. That is, they go to the ocean and they come back into fresh water where they breed, at lay their eggs, and then the babies live for a while in fresh water. So, at our cabin uh, is one of the places where lampreys spawn, and then you can get uh, lamprey babies, which are a different form called an amacete. So, uh, the kids just found one here, and so let's take a look at it. So this is a lamprey amosite, but it's beginning to change into the size and shape that will go a long migration, hundreds of kilometers down to the ocean, where it will then uh, take up a parasitic life cycle in the ocean. In the sand and gravel and mud of many northern rivers, there are a lot of lamprey that are there for up to seven years, living a filter feeding life cycle as an amosite and then they'll all metamorphose, go out to the ocean, become parasitic on other fish, get really big, and then swim all the way, hundreds of kilometers back up these rivers to spawn and lay their eggs back in their uh, natal streams. You can have these large families of otters that we see with this very strange behavior where they're sort of rolling and turning and diving down in the water. And I'd been recording this for a long time, thinking they were just playing, not sure what was going on. And then I took this video and zoomed in on and slowed down uh, what they were doing when they came up. You see it chewing right there. And I realized that what they're almost certainly doing here is eating lampreys. They're digging them up from the bottom, from the sandy bottom and the muddy bottom where just the same place as our kids find them and uh, pulling them up to surface and eating them and going down and doing it again and again and again. So these are pink salmon that are swimming up the stream on their way back uh, to their natal, that is their home spawning areas in uh, headwater streams like where our cabin is. These migrations are very difficult for salmon and they have to overcome many obstacles. These salmon, for instance, have migrated several hundred kilometers up the Skeena River to get to our cabin here. They have to overcome many obstacles, most obviously are waterfalls, and so you hear, here you see pink salmon that are attempting to leap, leap up a waterfall that is just upstream of our cabin. Waterfalls are also places where animals and people have long uh, been able to exploit salmon, uh, and indigenous people in particular traditionally would use nets and gaffs to harvest salmon. Coho salmon, which really like to spawn in shallow waters, have to encounter beaver dams. So here's a very small beaver dam that the salmon are surmounting without much trouble. But there are larger beaver dams that often have shallow water below them that make it hard for the salmon to get up. And so I have this video of uh, a whole bunch of salmon trying to leap over this one waterfall. And as you can see, many of them don't make it. Some of them get kind of stranded. And I was watching and got kind of nervous at this poor salmon. And so I tried to put it back in the water. Uh, I wanted to put it upstream, but it ended up downstream. Sometimes they make it, and so here you can see that they leap up out of the water so they can jump the really fast part of the main current, and then they land on the top and swim really, really hard to make it up above the waterfall. Here's what it looks like uh, from uh, underwater. It's not just beaver dams, but also just natural obstructions. Here are just a series of tree roots that coho salmon are trying to leap up. So here are a bunch of baby coho salmon, juvenile uh, coho salmon called par, that are hanging out in a shallow area of the stream. Now, coho salmon are really famous for occupying these little side channels that get isolated from the main stream and just hanging out there for most of the summer until the water levels increase and then they can go back out into the main stream and the following spring migrate to the ocean where they will take on an anadromous life cycle. So here are a bunch of uh, coho salmon sped up so you can see how they're holding their position in the current, using their caudal fins at the end, anal fin on the bottom with the white line, which is what tells you it's a coho salmon, among other things. And you can see all the little fine fin movements that help to maintain their position as they're foraging in the, uh, the slight current. Pink salmon are only here every second year because they have a strict two-year life cycle where they always mature at two years of age. And so in odd years, you might have a lot of salmon and then not in even years, simply because the odd year run is strong and the even year run is not.
and they never intermix. Now, at our cabin this year, 2021, there were very large numbers of salmon spawning at this point. So here you see a number of females with their attendant males that are building and defending their nests, which are called reds. Now, the females will remain relatively stationary. That is, they'll occupy an area of maybe four meters square, maybe a bit bigger, where they defend that area from encroaching females. Meanwhile, males are, tend to be more mobile, where there are groups of males that are attending to individual females. Now in this next uh, clip, you can see some of the behaviors of the females. On the right, the female is digging in the gravel to prepare a little egg pocket of large rocks for her eggs. And so you can see there's large rocks in the bottom, and the female is probing her anal fin into those rocks presumably testing to make sure that they are of the quality of uh, preparation that she wants. Meanwhile, all those males behind her are jockeying to be close to her for the precise moment at which she actually spawns. Now here the female is a little bit out of the nest, let the males calm down, and now she's going to go back in and decide that I'm going to spawn. The other male rushes in really quickly, and then all the other males try to get in there too. So let's slow this down and take a closer look. So here the female is putting her vent to release her eggs down the bottom. The dominant male sees that, rushes forward, and releases a little squirt of milt or sperm to fertilize the eggs. Meanwhile, the other males rush in and try to share in the action. Here's another angle at the same thing. You can see the female moving over, and they're doing what's called gaping, uh, either to synchronize their behavior or perhaps to help hold them in position where they both release uh, their gametes. They're fertilized, and the other males rush in in hopes of getting a little bit of the fertilization opportunity. And so now she has to cover them up quickly. So she does what's called covering digs. She moves forward and from various angles and just kicks lightly at the gravel to put slightly smaller rocks on top. And then if we speed this up, we can see the female doing this many, many times and layers of smaller gravel accumulating on top of the larger rocks that are housing the egg pocket in which she's placed her eggs. When it comes to other species of salmon, the basic mechanics are the same. Chinook salmon, or king salmon for example, as you can see here, tend to occupy much faster water. Here's a spawning aggregation on the upper river, and you can see the reds that are the grayer color interspersed among the greener gravel. And you can see the same clusters of females with males attending to them and competition and digging moving among the various locations on the stream. Chinook salmon reds tend to be much more spaced out than pink salmon reds, in part because they're less numerous and in part because the fish themselves are larger. Being larger, they're a major attraction to predators and we have seen bears attempting to catch them in this section of stream. So let's go underwater for a second and see what the salmon look like as we approach them in a raft. And you can see in the shallow water, they are being scared by the raft and running away. Of course, they'll quickly come back to defend their reds again. They're like little torpedoes jetting away from any threat. Maybe it seems macabre to be showing you this live but moribund, almost dead salmon. But the reality is, is that the tens to hundreds of thousands of pink salmon that are in this river right now, including maybe a thousand just on our property, are all going to die within a week. It's called semoparity. That means you only spawn once and then you die. And they do so partly because they run out of energy. So they gathered energy in the ocean by foraging in the ocean, and then they stop feeding, swim 200 miles upstream, or in some places, you know, way further than that, like 1,000 miles upstream, 1,500 kilometers, and using only their stored energy. And then they do all their spawning with their stored energy. And they, it's so intensive, they work really hard, and then they die. And a bear or a eagle or something is going to have a really nice dinner.
So what the bears will do in the fall is they'll patrol up and down the shorelines looking for live fish that they can catch or, more often, dead fish that they can pick up and scavenge and eat. This mom here is trying to get as much energy as it can going in the winter because it has a bunch of cubs that it needs to feed. Now, three cubs are pretty rare for a grizzly bear to have, but in fact, this one had four cubs. So they're all going to den with her and need food over the winter, so she has to get as much energy as she can in order to provide them with milk during the long hibernation period in the winter and to get them ready for the spring. Here's a dead Chinook salmon that has probably been foraged on by many things, but at the very least, certainly an eagle, as you can tell from this bird poop, which in fact is also pee, and the whiteness is uric acid, which is water insoluble, why it's so hard to wash off a car. Some salmon just sort of escape the whole process and just float away, end up on the bottom of the river and just sort of rot away, rot away and contribute their nutrients to the stream directly. So. Here's a Chinook salmon that found that fate. So the, uh, that guy's basically food for bacteria now. Circle of life.